It's great to be here. I'm delighted. And uh, I'm going to talk today about three of my books, so uh, three for one deal. And uh, they, as David mentioned, they all have this common theme of self-experimentation, trying to improve by testing. And right before the talk, this is probably not the way to start the talk, but I was in the bathroom, and uh, the sign over the urinal had a little slogan, testing rocks. So uh, all about testing your code. So I was like, I'm in the right place. Uh, my, the first book I thought I'd discuss was uh, The Year of Living Biblically. And uh, this came about because I grew up with no religion at all. Uh, as I say in the book, I'm Jewish, but I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So not very. Uh, but uh, religion is such a powerful force in society, and I wanted to know more about it. Why are people attracted to it? So, and I also had a son. I wanted to know what to teach him. So I decided I'm going to learn about religion. I'm going to learn about the Bible. And I'm going to try to learn about it from the inside out, by living it, by following in the footsteps of our ancestors, and uh, actually follow, as literally as possible, every single rule in the Bible. Uh, so that's what I did. I got a, a board of spiritual advisors. So I got uh, rabbis and ministers and uh, atheists and scholars. And I bought a stack of Bibles, and I read through. And I wrote down every piece of advice, every rule that I could find in the Bible. That turned out to be quite a long list, uh, over 700 rules and pieces of advice. And I wanted to follow them without picking and choosing. I said, I'm going to go for it completely. So I wanted to follow the famous ones, like the Ten Commandments, uh, love your neighbor. That's a solid one. Uh, but I also wanted to follow the less famous rules, the obscure ones. Uh, that don't get a lot of press. The Bible says uh, in Leviticus that you should not shave the corners of your beard. And I didn't know where the corners were, so <laughs> I thought to, I would just grow the whole thing. And, uh, and that's what I looked like at the end. As you can see, some serious topiary hanging from my chin and well, sort of a, a Kaczynski vibe. And, uh, and I did actually spend quite a bit of time at airport security. Uh, that is true. The Bible says that you should not wear clothes made of mixed fibers. That's in uh, Leviticus 2. And uh, I thought it seemed a little odd. It seemed a little like uh, God was micromanaging there. Uh, but I thought, I'm going to follow it because that's what it says. The Bible says uh, in the Hebrew scriptures many times, it says that you should stone adulterers. Uh, and I thought, OK, I should at least try. And uh, I was able to stone one. I'll just give you an example. Uh, <laughs> it was in the middle of the year, and I was really getting into it. So I had, I, you know, I was wearing the robe and the sandals, as you can see. The sheep was, uh, that I didn't have. That was a rental sheep just for the, the fo so, but everything else. And I was in uh, the park here in New York, and I, uh, this man came up to me, and he said, why are you dressed like that? And I explained. I'm trying to follow every rule in the Bible, from the Ten Commandments to stoning adulterers. And he said, well, I'm an adulterer. Are you going to stone me? And I said, well, that would be fantastic. <laughs> I said, thank you for this off. And I took out a handful of stones that I had been carrying around in my pocket for just this opportunity. And they were small. They were pebbles. So I showed it to him. And I said, you know, I, it's not big. He was very aggressive. He grabbed the stones out of my hand and threw them at my face. So I thought, an eye for an eye is also in the Bible. And <laughs> I threw one back at him. So that's, that's how I checked it off the list. Now, at the end of the year, I, I put down my stones. I shaved my beard. Uh, but I will say uh, that there were some life-changing insights I got from this. Uh, and some takeaways, and there are dozens of them, but I'll just give you a couple. Uh, one is the idea of gratitude, and because the Bible says that you should be thankful. So I took this literally, and I was like, I'm going to be thankful for everything. So I would press the elevator button. I'd be thankful the elevator came. I'd get in the elevator. I'd be thankful it didn't plummet to the basement and break my collarbone. So this is hundreds of times a day I was being thankful, and it was a strange way to live, but it was also wonderful 
because it really emphasized the fact that hundreds of things go right every day that we take for granted. And we focus on the three or four that go wrong, or at least I do. So it's a radical shift in perspective. And actually, it inspired my next book, which I just finished writing yesterday, only eight months late. So I'm proud of myself for that. Uh, and that book, the premise is I take one of my great joys, my morning cup of coffee, and I try to thank every single person who made it possible. So the barista, of course, but I flew to South America, and I thanked the people who grew the beans, you know, the people who, the truck driver, the people who made the truck, the people who made the steel for the truck, the people who got the iron to make the steel. And as David and I were talking about, it, it's exponential. So the idea is there are thousands of people that uh, contribute to every little thing we do, and, uh, and we take it for granted. Uh, so it's, again, about connection. Uh, the second lesson from this Bible book was, uh, was the power of action, the power of behavior to shape your thoughts. Uh, there's a great quote from the founder of Habitat for Humanity. He says, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. It's sort of basic cognitive behavioral psychology. Like you act as if you're happy or act as if you're kind, and eventually your mind will catch up. Uh, for instance, uh, compassion. I, I, it just, it's not an emotion that comes naturally to me. I have some, but not, not very strong. So I, I had to build it up for this. So I would, um, uh, my friend was in the hospital. I hate hospitals. I didn't want to go. But I was like, what would a good person do? What would a good friend do? Uh, they would go. So I forced myself to visit the hospital. And, uh, and it tricked my mind. I was like, oh, I'm in the hospital visiting a sick friend. I must be quite compassionate. And, uh, and my mind, you do that enough, and your mind catches up. It's sort of the, the fake it till you become it idea. Uh, and then the, uh, the final takeaway I'll mention today is the, um, the absurdity and delusion of fundamentalist thinking. Uh, because part of the motivation for this book was, was to expose the absurdity of fundamentalism by becoming the ultimate fundamentalist and taking the Bible at its word. Because I, I do find it disturbing that, uh, by some measure, 40% of America, millions and millions of people, say they take the Bible literally. And that's why they believe homosexuality is a sin. That's why they believe. The Earth is 5,000 years old. I mean, this is a tremendous number of Americans. And it seemed to me they were taking parts of the Bible literally, but they were very selective. They were cherry picking. And they were not taking the Bible literally. They were not um, uh, wearing, you know, avoiding clothes made of mixed fibers. So uh, I wanted to show that if you do take the Bible completely literally, then you're going to act like a crazy person. And it is not a good idea. And that we all have to acknowledge that when we engage in ancient texts like this, that we are picking and choosing. And we are doing a cafeteria-style religion. When we are cherry picking. And that, listen, that's fine if you pick the right cherries. If you pick the cherries of compassion and loving your neighbor, great. Um, but you can also pick the rotten cherries of uh, 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 of hating those who are not like you. Uh, the, uh, the second book uh, I'll talk about today uh, was about what's called uh, Drop Dead Healthy. And so this was not my spirit. This was about the body. And this came about because for most of my life, I've been in terrible shape. Uh, so uh, I, was, uh, I was what you call, I, I wasn't traditionally fat. I was sort of skinny fat. So I looked like a snake that has swallowed a goat. Uh, <laughs> and I got sick all the time, like literally like every week. And my wife said, you know, I don't want to be a widow in my 40s. You got to get in shape. So I, I decided to do what I did for the Bible book. And I, I was going to test out every single piece of medical advice I could find. I got a brand, board of medical advisors, uh, doctors, nutritionists, trainers, geneticists. And I wrote down every piece of advice I could find. Again, even longer than the Bible, hundreds of pieces of advice. And it, for the next, it was supposed to be a year, but I was such a fixer-upper, it took at least two years. So for the next two years, I tried everything, and it consumed my life. Because if you're trying to follow every piece of advice, 
Like, you, there's no time. You, you can't have a job. You guys have to quit Google. Because uh, there's, uh, there's aerobic exercise, anaerobic exercise. You've got to meditate every day. There's huge evidence on the benefits of meditation. Uh, you should probably pet dogs. There are some, some <laughs> solid studies that that reduces hypertension. Uh, I didn't have a dog at the time, so I would go to the local dog park and pet strangers' dogs, which was received with mixed, uh, mixed reactions, both from the owners and dogs. Um, you have to uh, put on sunscreen. If you follow the American Dermatologist Association recommendations, you should be putting on sunscreen every two hours. And <laughs> you should be putting on a shot glass full of sunscreen. That's like my entire salary would go to sunscreen. Uh, you've got to prepare food. We all know processed food is, is terrible for you. You've got to eat food. And if you follow some recommendations, you should take a long time eating food because we are a nation of under-chewers, that we, uh, we just wolf down our food. And the danger of that is that we'll over, it's, it's a sort of a, uh, an excuse to overeat. Because as you might have heard, it takes 20 minutes for our stomach to tell the brain that we're full. So if you are scarfing food down, it doesn't have time to send the message. And you guys need to redesign the human body. That is, uh, that is it's got some real problems. Uh, so anyway, uh, you should chew. And I actually, I found this group. They are like hardcore. They call their movement Chewdyism. Uh, I didn't make that up, so don't blame me. But they say you should chew 100 times per mouthful. So I tried this. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's like it takes a day and a half to eat a sandwich. And uh, I don't recommend it. But the, I do think there is some wisdom to chewing more and slowing down our food. Um, uh, since I was a, a human guinea pig, uh, I tried everything. I tested everything. I tested. Um, I took a sleep test, of course. Didn't get a great night's sleep that night, shockingly. I tried uh, every workout I could find, including the, um, this is the caveman workout. The whole paleo thing was just taking off. So we went to, we went to Central Park and threw boulders and climbed trees. Um, and uh, oh, I wrote the book, of course, on a uh, treadmill. So it took me about. I think it was I think it was about 2,500 miles, uh, about to like Arizona, somewhere around there. Um, in the end, uh, again, I did not adopt everything. I don't uh, crawl around naked in the woods anymore. But uh, I, I, again, as always with my experiments, I hope there is some takeaway, some life-changing uh, takeaway. And and for this one, to me, uh, the. The best health advice is almost the simplest health advice. I mean, it is so basic that it can be summed up in a paragraph. Like most health books should just be a paragraph. And, and it's stuff you all know. It's like, you know, move more, eat less, eat good food, real food, not processed food. Um, uh, do the, um, uh, you know, uh, don't smoke. Don't hit yourself in the head with an ax. Like, it's very basic stuff. Uh, there is some evidence for high intensity interval training. So if you're into that, do that. But it's really quite basic, and we all know it. And to, the mystery to me is, is why we don't act healthily when we all know what acting healthily is. And that, to me, is where you can find some interesting insights in how to motivate yourself, how to sort of engineer yourself to be more healthy. And there were several interesting strategies. I'll just give you one that works for me. And that is, it's this idea of egonomics. It was a, a, that's a term coined by a Yale professor who talks about how we all have uh, two selves, at least. Uh, we have our present self who wants to just hang out and eat Cheetos on the couch. And then you've got your future self who wants that present self to you know, get on a treadmill or, or eat some salad. So we've got these two selves that are in conflict. Uh, and one of the keys to making better decisions in every part of our life is to try to remember our older self. And I, like, you know, I think of my older self I, as some other person that I, I want to treat well. I want to treat that person like I would treat a friend. And uh, you can do this visually. 
And actually, you guys can help me, because I, I did find some digital aging software. And, uh, but it's not great, so uh, if you guys have better ones. Uh, so I printed that out, and I put it over my desk. And, and it does inspire me sometimes. I'll look at it, and I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to do this for the older version of me, who I want that guy to be around to see my kids grow up and uh, you know, get married or not get married, whatever they choose. Uh, so that is just one of the ways. It's all about how to motivate yourself, I think, as opposed to what is healthy. Because people try to make a lot of money by telling you they have the secret bullet, you know, the blood type diet, whatever. Dr. Oz has a new cure every day. But, but really, science moves more slowly than that, and, uh, and we know what is healthy. All right, so the final book I want to talk about before opening it up to any questions you might have is uh, this one uh, was started about four years ago. This started because I got a very strange email from a man, and he said, you don't know me, but I am your eighth cousin. Uh, and I thought, as you might, that he was going to ask me to wire $10,000 to his Nigerian <laughs> bank. Seemed sketchy. But it turns out he was legitimate, and he is this uh, man who is obsessed with helping to build these family trees that are big. Uh, they're not really trees. They're forests. They are massive, interconnected forests. And not just thousands of people, millions of people. So it's a new, it's a, I always thought genealogy kind of stodgy, like, you know, sort of in the needle point. No offense to needle point. Uh, some people, <laughs> I once said that, and people were like, needle point's hip now. Sorry. But anyway, I just thought it was a little stodgy. But it, but nowadays, it's actually not at all. And it, it, it's affecting every part of our lives, politics, race relations, uh, happiness, uh, because there are these amazing revolutions, technological revolutions going on in the field. And, and there are two main ones. One is these massive family trees where you have millions of people connected, sort of a Wikipedia model. You put up your tree, and you can connect it to other trees if you share a relative. And, uh, and it's almost become, it's like the ultimate social network. It's like uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but everyone's Kevin Bacon. And you can connect to almost anyone in the world. Like, I'm on one tree. With a, it's got about 110 million. And uh, I've got my cousin, Barack Obama, who is my fifth great aunt's husband's brother's wife's seventh great nephew. So we're very close. Um, <laughs> but the idea is, as again, we are all connected. And for the first time in history, we can actually see how this is happening. Um, the other revolution, as you probably know, is genetic testing. You, you can spit into a tube and, uh, and send it off and get your ancestry percentages, allegedly, and, your, um, uh, and, and a list of hundreds of cousins you never knew you had and might not want to have, but, uh, but there they are. Um, now, this, I, I was fascinated by this, and I thought this has to be the topic of my next book. And as I got into it, what struck me was, uh, like all technology revolutions, uh, this has the potential to do tremendous good for society. I, uh, it also has potential to do tremendous ill to society. So let me quickly go over how I think it could be great for us, and then how it could take a left turn and take us down some dark alleyways. Uh, the way it could be good, I think, is it's just a very first way is just the very simple, almost childlike fact that we're all one big family. But now we can actually see it. You can see it concretely, and it, makes, uh, it actually makes a difference. And the hope is that when we realize this, we will treat each other with a little more kindness, or at least a little less horribleness. And there is some empirical evidence that this is true. There was a Harvard study a year ago where they took uh, Palestinians and Israelis, and they told one, group that they were, they showed them how they were related, and the other, they, they didn't. And that test group that were, knew how they were related to each other treated the other group with more kindness. They, they, they didn't uh, buzz them as loudly on a memory test. 
So there is some evidence that it might work, this idea of we're all family, then we should be kinder to each other. I've seen it on a personal level. This is not quite as profound as Palestinians and Arabs, but for instance, I, uh, I always hated Judge Judy, the uh, personnel, TV per I just thought she was obnoxious and nasty and not that smart. But then I saw that she's my eighth cousin, and it actually had, rationally or not, it had an effect. I was like, oh, she's not so bad. She's just Cousin Judy. She's just doing a shtick. She's probably a sweetheart underneath. And uh, so my hope is that this Judge Judy effect will be good. The second way I hope it will be good is, um, is that it'll expose this myth of racial purity. Um, and, and one of my advisors for this was uh, Henry Louis Gates, the, uh, the Harvard professor. And, and that's one of his big themes, is there's no such thing as racial purity. We are all a mix. We are all mutts. And, uh, and that's good. Um, and there are, there are some interesting phenomena happening where white supremacists take these tests and then they find out, some of them, that they have African American or Jewish uh, heritage. And, and the reactions are mixed, of course. They, you know, some <laughs> deny it. They say, oh, 23andMe is a big conspiracy, a multicultural conspiracy. But some actually have this change of heart and like, oh, you know what? Uh, my worldview may not be that accurate. So, so the hope is that, that this will increase. And, um, and I myself, I, I took all the tests. I took six or seven of them. They all revealed I was mostly Jewish, but they had different nuances. One said, which was interesting, I thought, I am 97% uh, Ashkenazi Jew, but 2.5% Egyptian Arab. So uh, I liked having the Middle East conflict in my body. Uh, the final way I think that it, it could be good is that it could broaden the idea of family. Because this idea of the nuclear family, the two parents and the two kids, is actually not, it's a, it's a pretty new concept. You know, when industrialization came and people moved to the city to be away from their extended family, that's when that idea that this is the normal family came about. It's not really the normal family. And I like the idea of broadening the family to include gay marriage, sperm donors, open adoption, uh, even group families. So I, um, and one of my favorite stories in the book is uh, I found these uh, twins, separated at birth twins. They were born in Korea. They moved, uh, they were both adopted by families in the United States, and uh, they didn't know about each other. But they had an, a mutual acquaintance on Facebook who said, you guys look weirdly similar, like same freckles even. And they got together, and they took a DNA test. Turned out they were sisters. And, uh, and it blew their minds, of course. Uh, they tried to contact their biological mom. She didn't want anything to do with it. Which, so that's the sad part. The uplifting part to me is that she, uh, the, one of the sisters told me, I feel like I have lots of moms. I have an abundance of moms. I've got my adoptive mom, my twin's adoptive mom. She's an actress, and so she has what she calls a momager. So this idea of uh, reconceiving family not just as strict DNA. Uh, one writer says, that he calls it, there's your biological family and your logical family. And I think that's a good thing, to expand the idea of family. Because as my eighth cousin, Hillary Clinton, said, it takes a village. Uh, <laughs> all right, then quickly I'll end. I like to end on a down note, uh, on the ways it could be terrible for society. Uh, so my main hope, of course, is that it decreases tribalism, which I think is one of the, it's sort of the, the problem of all problems. Because if we cannot cooperate as a species, we cannot solve these worldwide problems like climate change. So hopefully it'll decrease, but there is a chance it'll do just the opposite and increase tribalism. I talked to one sociologist uh, at Princeton who, that's his greatest fear, is that these DNA tests, everyone will get their DNA tests and, uh, and go into their own little silos, their little ethnic silos, and uh, his nightmare scenario is sort of a 23andMe 
meets Tinder. So you like, you know, you're 72 percent uh, Scandinavian. You will only date people who also are 70 percent Scandinavian and above, and that it will uh, sort of turn the tide against the decades-long trend of intermarriage between groups. So uh, that is one potential downside. There's also, I mean, it's, it's going to be psychologically traumatic for some people because an estimated 2% of the world, and that's a lot of people. Uh, you guys are better at math, so you know how much it is. But that's a lot of people. And 2% of those are what, what are called euphemistically non-paternal events, <laughs> which means that their father is someone else that they don't know about. Uh, and uh, so we're going to see an increasing number. The world is going to be like one big Maury Povich show as people discover more and more that they have a father. And, and it all depends on how we react to that information. I have a chapter in my book about a guy who as an adult, he has nine siblings. He lived in the Midwest. And they took DNA tests. And it turned out every single one of those nine siblings was from a different father. Uh, and the biological, the assumed father, was biologically the dad of none of them. Uh, so again, like Maury Povich times like exponentially. Uh, now, and, it, and it was interesting, the reaction, because some of the siblings were, were understandably horrified and upset. You know, my mother is a, a tramp, et cetera, et cetera. But some, hey, the one I interviewed actually tried to reframe it and be like, oh, this is nice. I have all of these new half-siblings. Uh, so it, it's a lot about how we react to this information. Um, Oh, I will end. Actually, I'm going to end on a slightly more positive note. Uh, because the book is partly about explaining these revolutions. Partly, it's a memoir of my own uh, delightfully odd family. I'm very grateful I have a, a strange family. And, um, and partly, it's, it's this adventure. Because this was about two years ago, I decided, since I have all these cousins, I will try to put on, let, why not have a party. Why not have a family reunion for all of my 7 billion cousins? So I did invite 7 billion. We didn't get 100% turnout. Uh, but we did get, we got several thousand in New York, about 4,000. And there were 40 simultaneous reunions. I called them the global family reunion around the world. It was the strangest day of my life. Very stressful. I, 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 don't, I can never be a, an event planner. Um, but it was the strangest cocktail of humans, uh, you know, of all uh, races and all uh, countries. And we had a, a minister and a rabbi and uh, a Buddhist monk on stage at one point. We had, um, we had like D-list celebrities. Uh, we had, we actually had Sister Sledge come and sing, uh, "We Are Family." So we sang along to that, and. Um, and here are some images. Oh, those are some of my cousins. Uh, so using these tools, you can figure out how you're related to pretty much anyone, as I said. So, so it's, all, it's a very good networking tool. Like, I remember I called up, um, there's Daniel Radcliffe. And that was George H.W. Bush. Like, it is a remarkably useful, it's like LinkedIn. So I called up his, <laughs> his press person, and I said, I'm writing a book about family. I'd love to interview. President Bush, since he's had an influential family. And she's like, well, we're not really doing any um, interviews anymore. And I said, oh, that's fine. But just so he knows and you know, uh, I'm his cousin. And we are, <laughs> we are like fifth cousins. He's my fifth cousin's aunt. So I went on. And she like, was like, all right, let me see what I can do. <laughs> so, so it actually worked. And here is, oh. Here are some shots of the reunion itself in New York. And some, there's the uh, Sister Sledge, and then some around the world. So I will end it with that. Um, 
But I, I'm happy to talk about that. I also have done a ton of other experiments that I'm happy to talk about. I did one, uh, I was here like, uh, what is it now, three or four years ago? Because I did uh, uh, an experiment with Google Glass. I was one of the first journalists to wear Google Glass uh, for, uh, yeah, I guess, a month or so. Um, and so happy to answer questions about that or anything else. But uh, that was fun. I had a great time. Thank you for coming. So uh, for, the, for the Bible year, uh, how did you resolve the contradictions in the Bible, like turn, turn the other cheek versus uh, an eye for an eye, stuff like that? Yeah, that is a very good question, uh, because there are a lot of contradictions. Because I believe, and I said this in the book, I didn't get in as much trouble as I thought, but um, uh, I said it, it, the Bible is very much like Wikipedia. It was written by dozens of people over hundreds of years. So when you say the Bible says this, the Bible says that, what you really should be saying is part of the Bible says this, part of the Bible says that. Uh, because, um, and, and to resolve, I can never resolve the contradictions, but I tried them both. So I would try eye for eye, an eye, then I would try turn the other cheek. Um, I remember in terms of uh, uh, parenting, this was because some parts of the Bible are, you know, be loving and kind and compassionate, but then there are parts in the Proverbs, especially, that like if you're a parent, you have to discipline your kid physically and not just with a hand, you got to hit him with a stick. Like that's what it says do not spare the rod, hit your kids with a stick. Uh, as you might have guessed, I'm the sort of this liberal Upper West Sider, I'm not not so into hitting my kids with a stick. Uh, so the loophole I found was I, I had this like uh, Nerf stick uh, and I would, when my kid was bad, I would like tap him. He thought it was hilarious. So he would run and get a wiffle bat and just start wailing on me with a wiffle bat. And I was like, this is not working. So, uh, and I will say one other difficult one was the, um, the rules of purity. Because the Bible, as you might know, in Leviticus, it says that you should not touch a woman when she's in her time of month. Uh, and, uh, and if you take it really literally, Leviticus says that you should not sit on a seat where a menstruating woman has sat because the seat has become impure. My wife found that offensive, so she sat in every seat in our apartment. <laughs> And I was forced to stand for the year, which later, as you saw, I did this book on health. And you know, if you believe some experts, uh, sitting is going to kill you. Like you'll all be dead by the end of this because you're sitting. So it's actually um, a good thing she made me stand for the year. So I thank her. Yes, sir. You just mentioned your your wife and your child. Obviously, your family had to go through this with you. Is there anything uh, that they just absolutely hated about the whole process? And is there anything on the flip side that they really liked about it? Ah, that's a good question. Um, well, it depends on the experiment. And, and I do get a lot of emails saying that, you know, your wife is a saint, and I forward them to her so she knows that sometimes the pain actually, you know, it will pay off maybe. Um, but yeah, they hate, she hated the, uh, the menstruation law. She hated the beard for the Bible. She wouldn't kiss me. Um, I did get, uh, this was about five years ago, I, got, I, I kept getting emails saying, you know, you're putting your wife through all this stuff. Uh, you, should, um, you should do an experiment where you try to be the greatest husband ever. Uh, and I thought, OK, I'll try that. And, and it was kind of hellish, I will say that. Uh, I mean, part of it was what you would expect. Part of it was like, uh, you know, the foot rubs, all the cliches, the, you know, the um, Kate Hudson movies. We saw those. Uh, but part of it was quite enlightening. Um, I'm trying to decide which part to mention. I mean, one thing that, that I found enlightening was uh, it relates to what I was mentioning earlier about how behavior affects your thought. So as part of my goal to be the best husband, every day I would buy her a little gift, a little trinket, just like 2 or $3, like you know, a little soap that smells like guava or whatever. And I would present it to her and buy buying and presenting a gift to her, it sort of convinced me. I'm like, wow, I must really love this woman that I am giving her a gift every day. <laughs> and, uh, and it made me love her more. Um, 
So that was, uh, I think that was, and I still try to do that. I, I fail miserably, but I try. And I will say, just when we're on the topic of my wife, I did an article for Esquire about, it's about 10 years ago now, where I, it was called, Do I Love My Wife? A Scientific Investigation. <laughs> and uh, the idea was because there are these scientists, these neuroscientists and, and anthropologists, Helen Fisher is perhaps the most famous, who investigate the science of love and, uh, and what parts of the brain light up. So I thought it'd be interesting to see, you know, do I love my wife? And uh, so they put me in an fMRI machine and filmed my brain as I thought about my wife and as I thought about neutral people, as I thought about Angelina Jolie. Uh, and, uh, and it was, you know, it was terrifying. It turns out I do love my wife, but uh, uh, only in two of three ways. Which, like, <laughs> after 10 years of marriage, like 67%, I thought was pretty good. So uh, I, felt, uh, I felt OK with that. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I've read a bunch of your books, so it's really oh, nice to thank see you in person. I was wondering if there's anything from any of the experiments you've done that you um, continued doing that you never thought that you would do, or oh. like that you've adopted in your life, um, or maybe other, you, you've had other people around you adopt. So just curious if like what's become part of sure, your actual sure, sure. <laughs> well, I will say, I mean, every, every ideally every one of these, there's something I take away. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time. So uh, just to give you a couple of random examples, I mean, I still right on the treadmill. I still do like, you know, I go pretty slowly, but I do do that. Um, I, uh, for, for, from the religion, I mentioned the gratitude. I still try to practice that. And I did uh, join a synagogue. Uh, and I do think there are benefits. The way I, s just uh, briefly about religion, uh, one, of, one scholar breaks it up into the three Bs of religion. There's belief, belonging, and behavior. So belief in God, belonging to a community, and behaving ethically or doing these rituals. So I actually think that the second two Bs have helped my life. Like, it's nice to have a community. There's lots of research that a close-knit friend group is healthy. Um, the ethics, if they're the right kind of ethics, I think it's good to reinforce them with a group. Uh, I just never got into the belief, the first B. So, um, uh, I, and I become increasingly worried that belief in a supernatural uh, being can be used for evil. Uh, so I become increasingly skeptical of the first B. But I like the second two Bs. So those two Bs are still with me. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Ajay, for sharing your stories with oh, us. Oh, my pleasure. So you made big changes to your life, big, big changes. Do you think everyday people understand how much power they have to change the way they live their lives? Ah, that's a lovely answer, lovely question. Uh, yeah, I do, you know, if I, I do preach the gospel that everyone should experiment on themselves. Um, and it's right there on the urinal in, uh, in Google. And I hope for, uh, for gender equity, it's on the back of the stalls in the women's room. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> I'm not going to check it out. Uh, but I do think that, you know, you don't have to, I'm, I get to do this as a job, so I'm lucky, so I can do it as, as radically as I, you know, I can wear the crazy outfit. But not everyone can, but you can make smaller experiments, and I get a lot of feedback. Um, people say, you know, I try not to gossip for a week, and it really changed my life. Or I try not to lie, or uh, even, you know, changing your toothpaste. I, I did one experiment all about cognitive biases and why I trying to eliminate all my cognitive biases, which, of course, is impossible, but you can try. And one of the cognitive biases was just, you know, the, the routine of brushing my teeth with Crest because I had always bought, you know, since I could remember. But there's no rational reason why I chose Crest. So the experiment could be just trying different toothpaste until you find the one you like best. And I use, uh, you know, Tom's has a delicious apricot flavored toothpaste, and, uh, which I much prefer. It's made my life better, this, that little change. So yes, I do think, it, I do preach the gospel of self-experimentation. 
Thank you. Yeah, hello. Thank you hello. for coming. Um, My pleasure. I, I, so I read your book about uh, uh, you know, becoming healthier, and this is really interesting, and it kind of made me think that you know, there's a lot of, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different people who go around saying that we should do one thing or another, and all these things are sort of, it does not work to, like, as you found out, it doesn't really do, you can't do everything, right? Right. And is there, is there any effort to put together, like, a sane set of advice? Like, this is what a normal person can do <laughs> with a set amount of time per day, um, you know, like, trying to have a really coherent set of uh, health advice. I like it. I think you should write it. I, <laughs> I mean, I think that um, the challenge with that would be, uh, if you say you have a magic bullet, then that is exciting and people buy it. Like, they asked me to write a health column for Esquire, and I said, all right, but it's not going to be that interesting because I'm going to write the same paragraph every week, which is, you know, get exercise, uh, eat non-processed foods, get a lot of sleep. And, uh, and then the second month would be like, OK, let me repeat this. And then I could get even like angrier and angrier. It's like, how many times do I have to tell you people? Here's what you should do. So I would say, um, but it is, it, there are some good books. Marion Nestle, Marion Nestle is a nutritionist who has a good book called What to Eat. Um, I think you don't even need a, a book on exercise because uh, aside from the idea of, uh, I do think there is some evidence that high intensity interval training, like going really hard for two minutes, uh, has some benefits. But mostly, it's just do exercise, you know, just whatever you find ha pleasurable, because you're never going to do it if you don't find it pleasurable. So it could be gardening, it could be building a stone wall, whatever. Um, so anyway, those are my, uh, my thoughts. Um, I mean, I think one of the big problems with health right now is, is the health media uh, because of the biases built into journalism. You, you want the man bites dog story. You want the, if you find one study that says bacon is great for you, that's the headline. That's the article you're going to write, not the 980 store studies that said bacon is not good for you. So it's this um, sort of the, the uh, unusual study syndrome and flaw that I think is super dangerous uh, and that we need more perspective. There needs to be context. I think of it as the rotten tomatoes of health advice. You know, you're always going to find a critic who loves Battlestar Earth. Uh, and, uh, but 99% of them are not. So you're always going to find a scientist who says, with, with good credentials, who says, you know, that you should only eat uh, broccoli if you have blood type C. Is there a blood type C? No, I don't think there is blood type B. Uh, but that is, uh, that, he's an outlier. So you've got to look at what the mass of the scientific community says and go with that. Thank you. So there you go. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, sir. So do you have any other experiments in mind? There, the Year of Living Biblically, the, the point, one of the points that you said was to demonstrate some of the dangers of fundamentalism. There's a lot of other dangers that, have, that are sort of taken root in the last 10 to 15 years. Any ideas for the year of living without X or anything like that? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I actually, uh, well, I've got the, I just finished the one about gratitude, um, which hopefully has this message of connectivity that, uh, that might resonate. Um, but, and this one, I haven't even written the book proposal, so hopefully no one will watch this and decide to scoop me. But I am fascinated by, uh, you know, how do we know what's true? What is, uh, uh, and this whole fake news phenomenon, and uh, basically it would be a, a book about epistemology, which is a very sexy word, I know, that, that is, <laughs> that's going to be, we'll say, a book about epistemology. That's my test. But it's sort of, you know, how do we know what's true, and how can we, uh, we fight these crazy biases, and, and this sort of, this destruction of the idea of an objective truth? Because I believe it's complicated. You know, I don't believe in black and white. I think, you know, you always, there's always, it's all about probabilities. So, 
it's hard to say, you know, there is an objective truth, but, but there is. We just can't ever get to it, but we have to try. We have to try, and that's, I think, we're losing that in, uh, in today, in our crazy political world. So I'm confused. Isn't it just, I Googled it? <laughs> that is a good point. Yeah, I actually am trying to think. I did have a couple of Google-related experiment ideas, and I can't remember what they are. But uh, I'll, I mean, I did do the one with the Google Glass, which was, uh, which was fun. Yes? Um, how do you find like, uh, the willpower and the discipline to stick to your plans? That's a good question. I mean, I, uh, partly it's, this, uh, it's the idea of faking it till you make it. Uh, and just like, um, and partly it is, I would say it's delusional optimism is a very useful tool that I use. Uh, so for instance, like with the health book, I, I would wake up every morning you know, filled with despair. But this is such a huge topic. How can I write one book about it? And, but then I would pretend to be uh, confident. And I would act as if I was confident. So I would call my publisher, and I'd be like, oh, this book, I think it's going to be big. Let's have a party when it comes out where we serve kale martinis, like the healthiest uh, drinks ever. And, uh, and then I would call and set up a bunch of interviews with doctors. And by acting as if I were confident, after like three or four hours, I started to become a little more confident. And that helped me from giving up, uh, helped me prevent me from giving up. So, so there it is, a little delusional optimism. Not too much, because as we know, delusional optimism has a huge downside. Like if you think, I've never been in politics, but I can be president, that, shockingly enough, does not work out. So, uh, so there you go. Yes, anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much. I loved it. Thank you again. Have a good day.